All right, hello everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Matt Lindenberg. I'm from outside of uh, this county. Uh, my, title, my title today is Reinforcement of Cheetah Populations Rewilding in North Central Namibia. All right, the cheetah is Africa's most endangered large cat. The population has declined from 100,000 to just 15,000 individuals in the last 100 years. Now, the country of Namibia, located in southwestern Africa, has the world's largest tree-ranging cheetah population. However, this population is drastically declining due to conflict with farmers who believe that cheetahs are responsible for killing their livestock. Now, various population recovery methods have been implemented, including rewilding. Now, rewilding is taking captive, held, and raised individuals and putting them back out into the field. My master's thesis looked at returning seven captive raised female cheetahs back onto Namibian farmlands with specific emphasis on prey and habitat selection. Now, we deemed rewilding truly successful if these individuals were able to go back out into the field, survive, hunt, reproduce, and raise their cubs to adulthood. <laughs> All right. So, moving on. These candidates came to the Cheetah Conservation Fund as orphan cubs. They were held in isolated enclosures. They were fed and exercised daily. Now, on release, you can see in the bottom right picture, if you like, they were fitted with the GPS collar. Now, this GPS collar allowed us to monitor their movements on the landscape without us actually having to be there. So, on release, we figured out what their prey preference was. We wanted to calculate what were they eating. We observed what they were eating in comparison to what was actually available on the landscape. With regards to habitat selection, we classified satellite imagery and overlaid these individual cheetah points onto this landscape. Now, we divided this landscape up into four different habitat types to see what they were preferring. The results indicate that these rewilded female cheetahs select four small antelope species as observed in the bottom left corner and highly avoided large species, including avoidance of cattle and livestock. They also showed increased preference towards thickened bush habitats, as well as habitat margins, meaning where two different landscapes came together. Most importantly, all seven cats were able to make kills on their own, which is fantastic, really fantastic. Of the seven cats, two were able to reproduce and raise their cubs to adulthood. However, we had two collar failures and three deaths. Now, the majority of these deaths occurred from farmers shooting our cheetah. Right. These cheetah were shot by farmers because farmers still have that perception cheetahs are responsible for livestock loss. Because 90% of cheetah live on unprotected farmland in Namibia, the key to su surviving or saving the species is informing farmers that cheetahs are not the killers they are perceived to be. And while we can see that this rewilding program truly works, the key to success, the key to saving these species is to work with local communities and farmers to show them that cheetahs do not result in loss of livestock or livelihoods. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jakia Fuller and my thesis is on identity development of black students in relation to black studies courses. Close your eyes and now imagine yourself as a young undergraduate student. Your hair might be a little thicker. It might be a little less gray, all right? Now think about those people who you had close to you during this time. Who are the faculty members and the, st and the students that you had the closest relationships with? Now open your eyes. Those people that you just thought of, they were close to you because you had shared commonalities. There was something about those people that you had, that you shared something with. This was my experience as an undergraduate student. I found that the people closest to me were also similar to me. The faculty members that I had the closest relationships with were similar to me. They were black, and so am I. <laughs> those faculty members also taught black studies courses. They helped me not only in my scholarship, but also as I began to understand and began to learn about the extended history of African Americans. This positive experience not only assisted me in my identity as an African American, but also led to the question, how does learning about one's history affect identity? Research suggests that students of color, especially at predominantly white institutions, tend to be more successful when they're part of organizations that support and validate their race and ethnicity. Identity matters. Research also suggests that African-American students tend to be more successful 
when they have African American role models in the curriculum, and when they have African American teachers. Identity matters. My research wants to, goes to explore two things. One, why do black students choose to take black studies courses or choose to opt out? And two, how does black studies courses affect identity development in black students at predominantly white institutions? I interview undergraduate students who are black studies minors and some who weren't, and this is what I learned. Every single student reporting, reported finding support in their student organizations and with their black faculty members. Every student who was a black studies minor reported having a better sense of self as a result of their studies. They had more self-respect, they had more self-confidence, and they were more proud of being black as they matriculated through college. So what does this mean? In a time where ethnic, ethnic studies courses and the relevance of these courses is being questioned, my study demonstrates the critical need for these courses and for these programs, not only for students, but also for faculty, staff, and institutions at large. My study also goes to show that while organizations provide a safe space for students and students of color, black studies programs goes beyond that and positively encourages a positive racial identity development for students. Identity matters. Thank you. I use fission yeast as a model organism to study cell division. Fission yeast grow to a certain length and then divide right in the cell center. And they are a great model organism because they're highly similar to animal cells such as our own. Within the nucleus of the cell, there is DNA. And the DNA codes for protein, which performs most of the major functions in the cell. During cell division, there's a protein-rich structure that forms a ring in the center of the cell. And this ring helps the cell to divide into two new cells. Animal cells have the same um, protein-rich ring-like structure that they use for cell division. This ring-like structure forms in the center and constricts to pull the sides of the cell in to allow it to divide into two. It's exactly like how the muscles in your body will constrict so that you can flex a muscle. Now, it's very important that the cells divide in the center because otherwise you can get unequal division of the DNA. As we know, there are many diseases that are caused by having too much or too little DNA. For example, Down syndrome is a disease caused by having an extra copy of chromosome 21. So it's very important that the cell doesn't divide until the DNA is perfectly separated and then the, the cell needs to divide right in the middle. Now, MID1 is a protein and fission yeast that is responsible for making sure the cells divide in the middle. And we have a similar protein in our own cells that performs the same function. Now, cells without MID1 will form um, these elongated cells that accumulate many nuclei, and this leads to problems with their division later on. For my research, I use advanced microscopy techniques to be able to really look at these structures in depth. So we are able to create a 3D image that allows us to turn the cell on its side and really be able to look at the ring in its native structure. To further characterize how MID1 is contributing to proper cell division, I perform um, mutagenesis to create four small point mutations on the protein. And then I observed that these led to these unraveled ring-like structures that led to defects in cell division later on. You see they start growing very long and begin bulging and branching, and they're really, they're supposed to look like this. They're very abnormal. And this is very reminiscent with what we see with cancer cells. They begin to lose normal functions and get variations in size and shape. And actually, the human version of the MID1 protein is often found very abundantly in many human cancers. Therefore, understanding how MID1 functions and how it's regulated can help us understand how the human protein is functioning properly in our cells. So we can work towards finding preventions and treatments for human diseases such as cancer. Thank you.